first at the seminar. Um, our invited speaker today is Michael Leckard, uh, the uh, Noir Floridian University and University of Bucharest, with the title Two Cultures Interweaving Art and Science in Mendelssohn's Letters from Sentiment. Michael, please. So, this, this paper I uh, am going to dedicate to my mother, who passed away in November. It was supposed to be presented the same week um, as I was supposed to present it in Savannah, Georgia. I, I had to cancel it and go to my mother's memorial, and it was read aloud by a colleague um, at a conference there. Um, so I wasn't in the room, but it's been recorded, and I will soon hear the critiques and so forth. But as I read it, I'm going to be, in some sense, honoring her. So it, it is not a PowerPoint, it is a paper that I'll be reading. I'm going to point out kind of the quotes on here. Um, and first I just want to set up a little bit of a historical background. So um, Moses Mendelssohn is a German Jewish Enlightenment philosopher of the 18th century, um, contemporaneous with Kant. Um, known by Kant, they, they knew each other, and similar to Kant, and yet different. So both of them are, both Kant and Mendelssohn would be considered rationalists um, in this sense, and both really took British philosophy very seriously, um, from Shaftesbury to Locke to Hume, they read it closely, but they also were German rationalists. So that both of them also really took art or aesthetics seriously, although the term aesthetics doesn't exist for either of them. So when I say art and science, they are trying to develop, and what my talk is attempting to do, is a science of art. <laughs> um, so while it's called art and science, and one thing I did hear as a criticism of the, when the paper when it's presented is I tried to use C.P. Snow, a 20th century, um, former scientist who became a philosopher, his lecture, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution from 1959. I tried to use that in the original version of this paper. I, I heard that it was just so torn apart in the audience by everyone who was there who were top, actually the top Kant and Mendelssohn scholars were in the audience and they thought the C.P. Snow stuff was awful, so I'm taking that out for today. I'm not mentioning the C.P. Snow. But he wrote a text called The Two Cultures which was basically about art and science, um, and that they don't understand or talk to each other. So behind this paper is a kind of challenge to C.P. Snow, um, but also a way of making sense of the relationship of art and science. And it is a, an attempt to do a very close reading of one text from the 18th century by Moses Mendelssohn called Letters on Sentiments. He published this text when he was in his mid-20s anonymously in 1755, um, which I think he was about 26 years old uh, when it was published. He was encouraged by Lessing to publish this text. Um, Lessing had published another text of his without his permission, <laughs> um, but also that there was a great discussion in Germany about the relationship of art and science, and I would say epistemology and um, feeling that was going on that this text really touches on in a way that I think no other text does of the time. So as I put on the handout, there are four characters to this text. I think it's helpful. It is a literary text and a philosophical text at the same time. Um, so one can read it as literature and philosophy, and I would say science as well. Um, the four views, or the four characters, and I'm challenging the way that it's been read up until now, um, but Euphrenor stands for art in a certain sense, or the artistic worldview, an English empiricist, although throughout, he is German, but he stands for a kind of English empirical view, um, and only writes four of the 15 total letters. So he, his voice is, is, is kind of 
minimized by Theocles, who's the second, who's a rationalist in the Leibnizian Wolfian school, and he writes 11 of the 15 letters. Now, these letters are all written by Mendelssohn, of course, so he is, and I'm, I'm claiming, as we'll see, that Mendelssohn is using these different voices in a kind of dialogue, um, reminiscent of Plato's dialogues, to present these different perspectives, and that, I will claim, he's not situated in one of the characters, um, which is the typical reading of these letters on sentiments. Eudoxus is a character that doesn't write a single one of the letters, but that he is literally an Englishman, not just standing for an English empiricist view, who, did not, who does not hold the same views as Euphrenor, and that he's much more Epicurean hedonist. Um, so he is kind of the perspective to which the entire text is critiquing. Um, a kind of pleasure is only the only good, that we aim everything towards pleasure. That's the Eudoxism view. Um, he's quoted a lot, and he's a character, but he's not. He only plays a part by being quoted by the others. The last character is the editor. Typically, the editor and Mendelssohn are considered the same person. Um, he only puts notes, footnotes, and in notes, uh, long in notes, regarding Descartes, regarding um, Newton, etc., in order to explain the kind of the philosophical background to the literary text. Um, I want to claim that the editor is not just the same as Mendelssohn, that Mendelssohn is actually playing polyphonically with different voices and with different perspectives, but that he is also all of them. Um, and that's kind of the radical claim against the literature of this text. So, Mendelssohn's letters on sentiments, um, Briefe über die Empfindungen, from 1755, is a unique literary and philosophical text with few other exemplar, exemplars just like it. Alongside Giordano Bruno's Ash Wednesday Supper from 1584-1585, Galileo's Dialogue on the Two Chief World Systems, 1632, or most explicitly Shaftesbury's The Moralists, a philosophical rhapsody from 1709, Mendelssohn is both hiding and revealing his own views through the various personae of the text. It is assumed in the literature that the editor of the letters is Mendelssohn, as I just mentioned to you all, and that the notes of the editor at the end of the text are his own interpositions into the dialogue alongside the introduction and conclusion. So there are two of the letters, there's actually an introduction and conclusion that is the editor's voice. Um, so one has to read this both kind of as a literary and philosophical text, and the philosophical, or the most obvious philosophical elements are in the introduction and conclusion and the notes from the editor. The rest could be considered like a dialogue of Plato's back and forth between Euphronor and Theocles. It may very well be the case that the editor is the same as Mendelssohn, but it cannot be assumed. I, I don't think it can be taken at face value. I thus want to challenge some of these readings as well as defend this text as both an aesthetic and scientific text. I will do this in three sections. First of all, I will treat the content of the dialogue, especially the first seven letters, by means of an overview of these, uh, um, an explanation of the style, but also an interweaving of personae. That's my first section. Second, I will ask, what is pleasure? That, that is the basic question, reminiscent of Plato's dialogues of the whole work. and related to the form of the dialogue, unlike the comment, or the content, sorry. Thirdly, I will read the second half of the letters defending the style of presenting pleasure as an interweaving of art and science. Unlike other dialogues, this so-called exchange of letters between Euphronor and Theocles also includes a third character, and a fourth, as I've described to you, who give us an outside perspective on the two main characters who are the only writers, so to speak, uh, except for the editor who comments. Um, I mentioned Bruno and Galileo, so I want to start with kind of thinking about Bruno and Galileo's dialogues. Um, 
they both wrote dialogues for different reasons, but I think similar to the entire tradition of the dialogue form, which is in line with Plato's way of writing dialogues. So when Plato writes on justice, on beauty, and Bruno and Galileo both are concerned with the Copernican world system versus the um, Ptolemaic or traditional word, uh, Aristotelian world system, they want to present, and this is again debatable, but the different views and how they argue against each other. They want to present characters that aren't just, and this is true with Galileo, but it's hard, it's hard to interpret Simplicio as not the stupid Aristotelian, right? Sim even in his name. So they want to present this opposing view, but they don't want to just say, okay, this person is totally ridiculous. They actually have something to say. Um, and both Bruno and Galileo, I think, are using the dialogue form in order not to just immediately ridicule the other perspective. Although that could be debatable. And I heard in Braun you were discussing Galileo Simplicio and trying to actually defend him in some sense. Uh, I wasn't there, but I, I heard that. So the scientific conversation of these dialogues, in both Bruno and Galileo's case, are conflicting ways of viewing the world in dialogue, in discussion, in conversation. Both the mathematical, scientific aspects of the two chief world systems, in Galileo's case, and as we know in Bruno's case, um, he, in the Ash Wednesday Supper, also a literary text, it's not because of this text, but somewhat because of this text, he's burned at the text, it burned at the stake in 1600. Um, so although we don't know exactly why, we can, we can speculate, because of his philosophical scientific views and theological views, the, the text, but also him, had a consequence. Um, perhaps if he had written only dialogues, in Bruno's case, he may have been spared. <laughs> I don't know. But, but a dialogue is a way to almost not prove your own view. That's, that, that is one way. Like, if you choose to write a dialogue, you are able to put in different voices in which, and polyphonic, poly, polyphony is a, is a view of a 20th century theorist named Bakhtin, um, who talks about how one can use mutu not mutually exclusive or contradictory voices claiming different things but still all true. So it's not that one is definitely attacking the other but also complementing or disagreeing but helping one achieve some kind of furthering of the view without contradicting. Um, that multiple voices are able to be held at the same time. So behind kind of even how I'm reading Mendelssohn, but also Galileo and Bruno, lies a kind of Bakhtinian view of polyphony, or heteroglossia is another term that Bakhtin uses. Galileo, um, in his setting, one might easily interpret this as science versus religion in Galileo's text. But if you read the text closely, I don't think it's a view of science versus religion. And somehow it's been misinterpreted, I think, since as the Catholic Church versus Galileo. But within the Catholic Church, there are different voices. There are the Dominicans, there are the Franciscans. There are more than one uh, way of thinking, even some of, what, some of whom supported Galileo and some of whom disagreed. Now, I'm just setting this up as kind of a way of doing dialogue in which Galileo cannot be dismissed as using dialogue form in order to just make Simplicio or make the Aristotelian worldview look stupid. <laughs> the dialogue format in both um, Bruno and Galileo is intended to hide, in some sense, what their real views were, to more or less place in the literary format a discussion and debate over philosophical and scientific issues. Going back to Plato, the choice of using a dialogue presumes a theory of dialectic or elenchus, that inherent back and forth conversation where more than one perspective is held. In a, and this assumes that you can achieve something in a way that one voice, like if you were to write an entire text with one narrator, so to speak, or one 
philosophical voice cannot do in the same way. What has been called the scientific revolution, as problematic as a term as that might be, some have challenged even this term, whether there was such a thing, and some have defended the scientific revolution. Um, the debate between Ptolemaic and Copernican world, world systems does not have the same analogy in the Enlightenment. So in the 18th century, you can't easily say there is, the, there is a, an equivalent to the Copernican versus Ptolemaic world system. But the, as close as one has, and this is my claim, is reason versus feeling. So this is what Mendelssohn is, is using as the equivalent, and I, I put equivalent in quotes there, I don't want to make that too strong, but to the 17th century debate between Copernican versus Ptolemaic world systems. While this is certainly a component of the letters, probably the most important one, there are also, and I, I will claim, two cultures. Um, and I don't want to make this too strong, but in this exchange of letters. Well, exchange of letters is not, they're not literally an exchange of letters. But. And looking at, just like the dialogues, probably weren't actual dialogues that occurred. They are, they are fictional constructs. While this is certainly a component of the letters, um, these two cultures is really about, as we would put it in 20th century historiography, and I don't think 21st century, I think we've challenged this, is rationalist versus empiricist worldview is another way to put it. Now, I think the way that history of philosophy and history of science has been taught in which rationalism and empiricism comes together in Kant in this nice, neat picture where Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz on one side, Locke, Barclay, Hume, I don't like that picture at all, and I don't agree with that picture, Mendelssohn is both a challenge to this picture, because he's influenced by empiricism as much as rationalism, and a supporter of a kind of rationalist worldview. But another way to look at this, besides reason and feeling, is rationalism versus empiricism. The format of the letters is also strange. There are 15 letters, four of them by so-called empiricist or artistic worldview, 11 by Theocles, the rationalist worldview. In the middle of the exchange of letters, the editor tells us they visit each other and converse in real life. The rest of the time they are apart writing, writing to each other. The last two letters, however, while in Theocles' voice, are primarily about Eudoxus, this other character, the literal Englishman. Perhaps the most overarching theme of letter 9, 14 and 15, so the last two and this kind of earlier one, is the question of suicide. That is the most central question that Mendelssohn, the author, wants to take on. However, it is the notion of pleasure that, entire, that underlies the entire work. So the entire work is about the notion of pleasure and what is pleasure. I will outline, with regards to content, the first half of the exchange now, and then interrupt this to talk about the nature of pleasure in the second part. Then return to the second half of the letters to discuss the two cultures. So I am. I'm basically presenting to you a kind of work in progress, so feel free to tear me apart. But the handout mirrors this, except that the A and B in my paper are in the middle of seven and eight. The, eight, the quotes from A and B are, what is pleasure? They could be situated within, but I put them at the bottom, because those are my basic, that, those are my basic questions for the entire paper. Um, and each one of those Roman numerals, one, one through 15, or actually I only have 14, but uh, are standing for a letter in the letters on symphonies. So I'm, I'm still working through this. You all are my audience. You're putting up with a work in progress, and you will tear me apart or think this is worthwhile to your own discretion. The first letter from Euphranor, who stands for the artistic worldview, claims that reason and pleasure harm each other. When thinking about beauty, the pleasure is disrupted. So if you were to think, what is beautiful, or what is love, if you start to rationalize it, according to Euphranor, you have destroyed the very nature of the question you are asking. You have somehow, as he'll say, killjoy, um, instahum in German. The other 11, i oh, sorry, um, when thinking about beauty, the pleasure is destructed. The other thing that Euphranor puts in here, which I don't have on the handout, is the nature of individual versus social. 
Euphrenor brings this up in the letter and says, actually, what really matters is the individual feeling, not the social feeling. So it's almost, you could call this a kind of relativist, whatever you think is beautiful. And this, this becomes a big question for Kant, Kant's third critique as well. You have access to that no one else has. You have this right to say, I think this is beautiful or I think this is pleasurable. Like, some of you here might think smoking is really pleasurable and maybe even beautiful. And then there are others who disagree. To use a silly example that is somehow Romanian, I don't know. Maybe not. So this is the, what Euphrenor brings up in the very first letter is, do people have a shared view of what is beautiful? And Euphrenor says no. All you have is access to what you think and in the first person. And this, this correspondence or these letters already give you almost a kind of debate, although Euphrenor or, or Mendelssohn do not specifically mention them, but Shaftesbury, Hume, and Kant all write about the same thing. Um, they all are asking this question in their work. Theocles is accused of being, quote, much more taken by the hope of becoming master of your sentiments through this insight and binding them to the scales of reason. So already in the very first letter, Euphrenor is pointing out how Theocles will just destroy the sentiment in order to be rational. You're not allowed to feel anything, is what Euphrenor is accusing Theocles of doing. Put simply, two claims are at the center of the first letter, the nature of feeling and the nature of friendship. Both, both of these are what he puts, and that's, this is what makes this text that I'm looking at a little bit messy, um, and, and why I put it in the way I did. It's not, I mean, you would not get this in a logic class. This is not the way that you would present arguments in a logic class. And I think Mendelssohn, who has done texts on, I would say, straightforward mathematical logic, like um, I was debate, discussing with um, a professor who was here visiting for the Newton workshop about Mendelssohn is respected in mathematics and has that kind of work, a whole text that also was published without his permission, but this is not that. This is something else. So he, he proved himself in the kind of mathematical scientific world and was respected, but this is his art endeavor, so to speak. Euphrenor disagrees with Theocles that pleasure can be defined as rational perfection. So this is the basis of all of the letters is, is pleasure, as it is for Theocles, a rational perfection? That's the first point. The second point, Euphrenor disagrees with Theocles that friendship, or a social kind of shared view, in any way contributes to an act of perceiving beauty or perceiving pleasure. So these are the two claims in that first letter. Dependence on others and dependence of pleasure only undermines rational autonomy. So the question, and I put this on the hand about, is reason a killjoy of our pleasure? That's, that's the question that sets it up. The second letter, again by Euphrenor, uh, presents and supports a kind of youthful ethics, um, a model of a way of life in which truth and beauty are opposed. So truth and beauty do not follow the same way of thinking. Rationality by itself does not give one happiness for Euphrenor. Feelings and enjoyments are requisite for happiness, and beauty concerns these. So beauty is just a matter of feeling. We can't think about it. That's, that's the basic. As soon as we think about it, it's, it's destroyed. The definition of beauty, though, that Euphrenor gives us, and I think this is very helpful and very, very important claim for the 18th century, is beauty rests on the indistinct representation of a perfection. So one should hear clear, distinct ideas of Descartes in there, 
and a disagreement with that. One should hear, okay, in order to know beauty, you can't have a distinct idea or a rational idea. You have to have a feeling that is obscure. These are the first two letters. Third letter, Theocles responds and says, okay, I'm going to refute you, F, you for not. You're wrong, as dialogues are meant to do, right? The difference lies, as I just mentioned, in the Cartesian terms clarity and distinctness. Euphrenor claimed, had claimed the lack of distinctness in a perception of beauty in his very definition. Theocles claims, and I quote, all concepts of beauty must be comprised within the boundaries of clarity if we are to perceive a multiplicity without tedious reflecting. So Euphrenor says, absolutely wrong, you're absolutely wrong, Euphrenor. You have to have a clear idea in order to have beauty. But you have to take all of the multiplicity of things going on. Like, if you're perceiving a flower and it has lots of petals and lots of different aspects, or all of that stuff, you have to bring it together into a simple, clear idea. Here, Theocles brings in Aristotle and astronomy. So, looking at the sky, and seeing all these stars, what makes that beautiful? Um, and I have a quote on here. The wise Stagirite ascribes to each beauty specific limits with respect to its size and maintains that it no longer deserves this designation if it either oversteps or does not reach those limits. So this is his, Theocles' claim, is that if you are looking at the sky or you're looking at a flower, it can't be too big or too small. If you're looking at a flower through a microscope, he doesn't use this example, but thinking of Hook and Cavendish on this. Um, you can't find it beautiful in the same way that you would in its flower aspect that it's meant to be. Same thing with the sky. If you are just looking at everything in a kind of vastness that's too big, it can't be beautiful. Now, this supposedly, according to this, is Aristotelian from the Poetics, saying a tragedy can't be too long or too short. It has to be just right. Um, now, the microscope is not mentioned here, so don't. Perhaps you could find a flower just as beautiful through a microscope. I don't know. That, that's a question. Aristotle's poetics can apply as much as, to, as much to writing a dramatic work. In this whole text, Letters of Sentiments, is less than 100 pages, but it's the longest text of all of Mendelssohn's writings, uh, of, all of Mendelssohn's philosophical writings. He translates the first five books of the Bible into, from from Hebrew into German, uh, and some other things that are longer, but, but this is his longest philosophical writing, and it's less than 100 pages, so uh, helpful. And I quote from Theocles, we only call the structure of the world beautiful in the proper sense of the term, when the imagination orders its chief parts in as splendid a symmetry as that of the order that reason and perception teach us that they possess outside us." End quote. Something too big or too small cannot be termed beautiful. That is, and that, that quote is on the, the handout as well. Fourthly, the fourth letter builds on this system of what Theocles had just defended by proposing an order. Choose, feel, reflect, enjoy. So he includes feeling in there, uh, from Euphrenor, but he thinks that by itself is not going to give you the pleasure of the beautiful. One also has to have these other aspects. And I'm going to start trying to move faster because I feel like I'm going too slow. The problem with Euphrenor's conception of pleasure, as I put on the handout, is with this obscure sentiment. So the, the qualification clear versus obscure, coming from Descartes, is the problem with Euphrenor's view of beauty, is that the feeling is based purely on a feeling and is a, an obscure idea, or it's obscure. The feeling is an is. And you've, um, Theocles attacks this as having, um, the, the problem with the obscure has to do with capacity versus incapacity. This is his terminology. So when you have a capacity to understand something, it becomes clear, but if you have an incapacity, it's obscure. 
And he uses this terminology, which, which comes up in other texts too. And this central claim for Theocles has to do with perfection. Think of Leibniz, think of best of all possible worlds, is that for you to experience anything of beauty for Theocles, you have to understand or have the capacity to achieve a kind of perfection in your perception. So perceiving something as beautiful requires something not being obscure, but clear because of its, according to Theocles, a capacity for perfection. For Theocles, an obscure perception cannot attain perfection, and thus puts God's providence into question. And I'm going to avoid that he uses another philosopher of the time. Um, I'm just going to skip that. So the fifth letter concerns boundaries between perfection and beauty. So he, he's, um, as you can see, you hear more of Theocles in his arguments. So you think, ah, oh, this is definitely what Mendelssohn really thinks. But later, Euphronor will come back with his arguments too. And it, it seems simple to say, yes, Mendelssohn and Theocles are the same here. But you have the editor. You have these other, other views kind of challenging and trying to contribute to the, to the dialogue as well. The fifth letter concerns the boundaries of perfection and beauty. In discussing Plato specifically, um, not only in the text but in the editor's notes, the author of this letter um, intends to expand perfection into one including ugliness. So here, um, and one of the, actually my commentator, I wasn't there for, but in, in Georgia where this paper was presented, she has written a book on it called The Ugliness of Moses Mendelssohn, saying actually beauty and ugliness are both ways of understanding perfection. Because um, typically, the pre-enlightenment view is that beauty is the most important category, and ugliness is a deviation from beauty, or deformity is another way in the 18th century they opposed, they opposed beauty to deformity or ugliness. Kant writes about this as well, and that Leah Hochman, who um, read this paper for me and commented on it, said, writes a whole book saying, ugliness is as important as beauty. So, Euphronor will support a feeling-based view of what achieves pleasure. Theocles is going to support, in some sense, a rational view of, of the pleasure of beauty and ugliness. That we actually achieve some kind of pleasure through ugliness. And the quote on the handout, which is from Theocles, is, the ugliest shapes, cloaked by human skin, the innermost, tiniest parts of creation where no eye penetrates, do not cease to be perfect in the sense of being complete in their reciprocal harmony with one another. So it's kind of a metaphysical view that even the ugliest things can achieve the same perfection as beautiful, as the beautiful. And Theocles makes a distinction between intellectual perfection and sensuous perfection. So you not, might not experience that, and this is why Theocles is defending this point of view through our sense-based perception. We might sense something as being ugly and think, oh, that's not pleasurable. But if you were to think about it, I'm trying to think of a good example. The smoking example is probably silly. But if you were to think about it, oh, that's actually quite pleasurable, because I'm not, my lungs aren't going to, I don't know. I, I can make up something, but. What smoking might be something ugly that you actually find rationally pleasurable in some sense. I don't know. Mendelssohn does not use smoking, but I was just sticking with what I tried to use in this example. The sixth um, letter has what I would say Theocles talking to himself. There are letters where you actually think he's talking to Euphronor, and there are letters where I think he's totally talking to himself, and this is one where he's just, he, th there's no interaction, it's just, okay, here, let me tell you what I think, and not even tell you. Let me just tell myself what I think. Um, he quotes the killjoy of pleasure view from the first letter, um, and Plush, who's a famous physico-theologian, um, 
Noel Antoine Pluche had an arrogant and perverted position, um, according to according to Diocles. And he discusses Leibniz and Bernoulli here, and the mathematics of Bernoulli, um, in order to refute Leibniz and Bernoulli refute the the Pluche physico theology tradition in this little letter. Um, but a position that he would hold is Euphrenor. So he thinks Euphrenor and the kind of physico theologians like Pluche have the same view as that it's really not very rational. It's ridiculous. But he puts this in this letter. Um, he also mocks, quote, the endeavor of the so-called alchemists. And he, later he will praise Newton up the wazoo, so it's funny that he, that he didn't know Newton was an alchemist. Um, and okay, these are just worthless details. Theocles once believed what Euphrenor believes, and this is what led him astray. So Theocles says, once I was like you, once I was as stupid as you, and thought pleasure was everything, and feeling when I was like 20, like four years ago or whatever, and now I have grown up and seen the light, and now I can think. And he says, the people that saved him, and he names these people explicitly, are Locke, Wolf, Wolf, and Leibniz. Saved him from being astray in the realm of feeling, and led him to genuine philosophy, that's what he says. So this is what I said, is a letter kind of um, seemingly to himself. Uh, and yet, what I put on the handout is the, the outcome of this. All sensations or perceptions are representations in the soul, and this is something that he gets from Locke, Wolf, and Leibniz, to which the judgment good is more important than the judgment beautiful. That's, that's the claim that comes from these figures, or so he tells us. Okay, seventh letter concludes the first half of the letters by explaining Theocles' metaphysical view. So he, he states a kind of metaphysics that sums up these first seven letters. He makes an argument concerning this. Quote, why did God not remove every evil in the world through a miracle? So, so again, it seems like he's taking on everything but all evils, according to Theocles, are representations of imperfection. He writes, quote, Our body, considered as corporeal, can feel neither moral nor physical evils. So what he's doing is he's saying to you, from our, your view, your conception of feeling doesn't allow for evil because you can't feel moral or physical evils. And this is a metaphysical problem with your view. And he's disagreeing with what was very popular at the time, even in, in Germany, and people were reading the kind of Hutchesonian moral sense view. The moral sense view basically says, with immediate perception, you can say, this is right or wrong, or this is beautiful or ugly, without thinking. Um, Francis Hutchison is a Scottish view. This comes out in Hume as well. Um, Mendelssohn had read these texts, and he's saying, Euphrenor can't judge something being morally good or evil in immediate perception or feeling. Mendelssohn, however, or, or Diocles, are saying that all evils are representations in the mind of imperfection. Found in the middle of my the next hand up. You're sharing. So this was halfway through the letters, and this is where the editor says, "Oh, they got together and talked to each other." And this is, I mean, a literary feature, but I think also important because I think for the second section of this paper, and I'm going to keep an eye on time, but I, I went a long time. Um, is what is pleasure? This is the question that the whole text is concerned with and that I'm really trying to look at in all of this. And a, a, a great contemporary living author, Rachel Zuckert, and this is text A on the, sec, on the back page of the handout, the bottom, uh, in an article called Kant's Rationalist Aesthetics, who discusses Mendelssohn, says, sensible Bodily pleasure arises from the obscure perception of increased perfection of the perceiver's body. 
Aesthetic pleasure arises from the clear perception of the sensible perfection of other objects of perception, and intellectual pleasure arises from the clear and distinct perception of the rational perfection of objects. I think she really outlines very well the three kind of levels of pleasure. And her book, uh, Cambridge University Press, a couple years ago, or 2007, so a little bit, on Kant, um, it's called Kant on Beauty and Biology, that's the title of it, gives a theory of pleasure based on a Kantian theory of pleasure that is defined as purposiveness without a purpose. That's her definition of pleasure, according to Kant. Kind of a fancy way of saying that we have some like leading towards something that we like, but we don't have a particular goal in mind, or purpose, or finality. Um, that it's this purposive, this, this feeling of purposiveness that we have, or uh, meaningfulness, but that's her, her definition of pleasure. Um, here, in this uh, quotation, one can see that, kind of based from Descartes' clear and distinct ideas, that there are three kinds of pleasure. Intellectual pleasure, um, aesthetic pleasure, and bodily pleasure. To me, this distinction, I think, helps. The editor, in the conclusion of the work, but also in the notes, says, when Theocles and Euphrenor met, what was discussed word of mouth between them had to do with this. That's what we're told. What is important for this understanding of the letters is that the editor um, attempts to bridge the views of Euphrenor and Theocles. In the conclusion, he states about this meeting, and this is the letter B quote, they were not able to agree as easily on how the origin of the painfully pleasant sentiments mentioned by Dubot is to be explained, at least until Theocles finally took over the discussion. The higher the tightrope artist stretches the rope, the faster I am drawn to the scaffolding. Even here, unnoticed, but streaming along with this sentiment are completely different representations which unite in our imagination and play a role in our awe and admiration. Now, this quote is easy to look at from historically later texts and say, ah, they're talking about the sublime. Mendelssohn doesn't have the word sublime here, but if the sublime is something in which pain and pleasure is mixed, and you have this feeling, as Kant writes about the third critique and many other authors, around this exact time that Mendelssohn writes, 1755, that you are both repelled and attracted to something. So it's a mixture, what's called mixed sentiment, of pain and pleasure or being repelled and attracted to the same object. Now, in Kant, the stormy seas, cliffs, you know, these are the, and we all have these 19th century images. I, I like to say, okay, let's separate the 19th century from the 18th century. But that these mixtures actually achieve some kind of stronger feeling than just pure pleasure. Uh, is that somehow by the pain being added, um, that actually we are moved more to do something or more impacted than just pleasure. So you didn't come to this lecture, or maybe you did, I don't know, because you were going to have nice, calm feelings, but because you thought, oh, well, I, I don't know about this lecture, but what if I don't? I might be punished. Like, okay, this works for my students because they have to come, right? Or their grade is impacted. But sometimes the, the threat of pain makes you actually do something more than, oh, I'm going to have a nice feeling doing it, right? So Mendelssohn, through the voice of the editor at this point, is saying, in their conversation, not in Euphrenor or Theocles' voice by themselves, right? There is this in-between state of pleasure and pain. They, he doesn't have a name for it. That is actually kind of more true or more powerful than pleasure by itself. But that's just an in-between state that challenges kind of, and, and if you think of even Plato or Aristotle's view of pleasure, it challenges a kind of traditional, either Epicurean or um, ancient Greek view of, and this requires a kind of reading of Phaedrus and other texts to try to say, what, what, how does this relate to ancient views of, that's not my goal here, so.
Um, but for this uh, point, what is pleasure? The key claim is that actually there is no such thing as uniform pleasure. There's not one definition of pleasure. There are, on the one hand, according to Zuckert's interpretation of Mendelssohn, intellectual, bodily, and aesthetic pleasure. And on the other hand, there are mixed sentiments that are a mixture of pleasure and pain that aren't even compatible with those three views of pleasure. Now, in the, in the literature, and I'm not going to go into all of that, there are several authors. The, the biggest one is Paul Geyer, who thinks this mixed sentiment is what's most important about all of Mendelssohn's texts. So that he claims this mixed sentiment, he just takes on it, and a few other people say, okay, this is what matters um, about Mendelssohn, the rest is. And I'm trying to actually say, no, at this development and this dialogue and this working through different forms of pleasure is as important as just looking at the mixed pleasures. So that's, that's what this section is I'm trying to argue with Paul Geyer and Rachel Zuckert, who, are, who were in the room when this was read, but I wasn't there. <laughs> so, um, one has to debate the other living scholars on this too, and that's an attempt. Third, third section is the second half of letters, and I'm going to do this as quickly as possible so we can go to Philos and do something fun. Uh, more pleasurable than this is that in the second half of the letters, which also, like the first half, begins with two letters of euphemar. So as I, as I showed at the top of the back page of the handout, is that euphemar mm -hmm. writes the eighth and ninth letter, and then Theocles writes the rest, including a 15th letter, which I didn't put on there. It mirrors that, and that, um, this supports, as I see it, again, why Mendelssohn can't just be associated with one he is one in all of them. He is both Euphronor and Theocles and the Emperor. Maybe not. I think Eudoxus is the least. Definitely Eudoxus is what he wants to absolutely take down. Um, in the eighth letter, so look at the back, back of the. Uh, following the visit and face to face discussion, Euphronor's response to the last five, we get we get Euphronor's response. Euphronor believes that a youthful mind, instead of Theocles, is over-reflective and he makes fun of him being old, elderly in capacity, feels the sentiments of beauty all the stronger. So when you're young, you're able to feel beauty. When you're old, you're boring. That's, that's kind of what Euphronor is saying. Reason does not disturb our joys. And remember, we haven't heard from him since the first two letters, so he's saying, you're wrong, reason doesn't impact our feeling. But contemplation must refer, and, and I quote, procuring the return of these exhilarating moments. So through contemplation, we actually can have a joy from our feeling by contemplating the pleasure that we once felt. It is too simplistic to say that Euphronor stands for, and I know at the beginning I claimed he is the artistic point of view, um, as in, if, if you know the sex, Kierkegaard's uh, aesthetic A versus ethical B in either or, but he indeed gives us no basis for which to argue besides youthful passion. So he does seem to have a fairly shallow view. And yet, he is also trying to take into account, through the dialogue form, something of the other's perspective. He's trying to say, okay, I need to take your rationalism seriously, you're my friend, I care about you, but I still think what I feel is right. <laughs> and that I Reflection and contemplation doesn't destroy what I feel. It breaks down, I think Euphronor's view breaks down, with regards to painfully pleasant sensations, quote, or fearful, terrifying nature, which is unlike beautiful nature. Here, Euphronor claims pleasure rests on imperfections. So, so Euphronor stands by saying, no matter what, I have an obscure sensation, these are imperfect, and I don't care, I feel it as pleasure. This is where suicide comes in, as one of the most central aspects. So starting in the ninth letter, suicide, and, and especially Eudoxus, um, 
as a character set who stands for someone saying, yes, suicide is okay. So if any of you have read 20th century existentialism like Camus, this is the 18th century equivalent of suicide, according to Camus, was the only real philosophical question. Now, I think that's ridiculous, but Mendelssohn says suicide is a real option to get out of everything, and Eudoxus stands for this point of view. Let's try to see how this relates to pleasure and rational perfections. I mean, that's what Mendelssohn is doing. Now, I'm sure all of you are thinking, what the heck does this have to do with art and science? He's using a dialogue form to talk about philosophical themes, and it, it's true, we seem to lose science, except, um, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, because I think we're taking too long today. And going into suicide is not really that useful right now, <laughs> unless all of you are really contemplating and need an argument, rational arguments against it. But, um, This is what's key. Theocles' response to you, Fernar, says simply that there are three views of human nature possible. And this is um, letter 10, and 10 on the handout. That the soul is solely responsible for all pleasure, that the body is the source of pleasure, or that both together are the source. And that is Theocles' use of both anatomists, he uses several anatomists and physiological works of the time, um, and also a, a, a discussion of mechanism, who scientifically described the reaction of the nerves when encountering, quote, the enjoyment of love and wine, a cool breeze in the muggy heat of summer, a gentle warmth when your limbs are frozen, end quote. Um, the Cartesian Malbrashian view, which Theocles is taking over, and is likewise in Wolf, is that the body experiences perceptions as somehow preserving the body. Um, the key here is that what we might term rational perfection is actually something that keeps the body alive. That pleasure and how we, like let's say, things like hunger, allow us to continue to exist. This is According to Theocles, the Cartesian Malbrachian view, he is defining as this is why the body is important. This is why we listen to the body. Not because it gives us this nice, happy feeling like the 20 year olds like. Not to make fun of any 20 year olds. The 11th letter, however, and that's, that's basically part of what the quote is on uh, 10. Or no, I didn't use any quotes. But 11 is, to me, the central aspect of art and science. This is where it all comes together. Um, Theocles defines the three sources of pleasure as, and I, this is a quote that's on the handout, sameness in multiplicity or beauty, harmony in multiplicity or intellectual perfection, and finally the improved condition of the state of our body or sensuous gratification. Quote. Art best exemplifies the connection of these pleasures, and music in particular. So he, he starts to go into music here. As the only one that surprises us with all three of these pleasures. So somehow art can bring together. And he particularly refers, the editor refers actually, not, not Theocles, to Newton's text on music, which I find so interesting that hardly anyone knew at the time. He refers and said, actually sounds and colors relate. Now, how he knew this text, I have no idea. I need to figure that out. But that he gives credit to Newton for, quote, discovering the harmony among colors, and says that no one has yet tied the harmony of the colors to music. Now, what I'm doing this semester uh, in Bucharest and why I came here is to try to figure out what the heck, why did all these 18th century figures, including Mendelssohn in this point, Kant, many others, uh, refer to Newton as inventing they, they give him credit, the field of aesthetics, because somehow he tied together how we view optically colors and light vision to the ear and how we hear sounds and music or tones in general. Harmonious versus disharmonious tone. They give him credit. Newton never wrote a work on aesthetics. I'm sorry, I mean, he didn't, right? He didn't really care about that. 
So why is it that people like Mendelssohn say here, or through the voice of the editor, saying Newton is to be given credit for doing the best work on relating the eye to the ear and how we experience pleasure through music and color. So like, Mendelssohn doesn't use the, these terms, but painting and music somehow have this analog. And Mendelssohn says it, but I'm like, did Newton really do that? Did Newton really care? Or Descartes, or any of these people? That's, that's a question that I leave open. The same beautiful sounds of music or application of painting can be analyzed in terms of its intellectual or bodily features. This goes back to the discussion in, I, in the text of students of insects, those who study insects. Um, how Newton applied his science to the eye and their harmonious tensions relates to how the vessels of hearing can be altered by the sounds. Passions arise with respect to a certain coloring or a certain sound or tone. Um, here he mentions Hogarth, another 18th century contemporary who was a painter, but also had a theory of beauty, in relation to his discussion and what Hogarth claimed is the line of beauty. So Hogarth says a curved line is more pleasurable than a straight line. Um, and he tries to tie this to whenever you experience a painting, you will always find the curve more attractive or compelling than a straight line, which you will find more analytic or dry, or you won't have feeling with it. Um, Theocles points to this idea, um, and I quote, I think this is going to hand out, perhaps, yes, perhaps it would not be improper for the line of beauty to be defined as the beauty of the true or apparent motion the visages and gestures of people that become charming through the beauty in their movements. These provide an example of the former. By contrast, the flame-like, or in Hogarth's terms, the serpentine lines, which always appear to imitate emotion, provide an example of the latter. Okay, I'm, the last two letters are about suicide, I'm gonna skip that. The point, um, in conclusion, is actually that, I'm just going to speak up, I have a conclusion that I can play, is that by means of the debate or the discussion in a dialogue forum between Lufrenor and Theocles with editor's comments and also Eudoxus, we have a better explanation or description or philosophical way of figuring out what is the relationship of beauty and pleasure, or rational and rational versus bodily perfections, and that the point that Mendelssohn wants us to take home is that, simply speaking, there's not a void as suicide. Actually, at the end, the last letter, and I didn't, I didn't go into this, but he tries to use mathematical reasoning to say there is no such thing as zero, or that zero would count for kind of like suicide or like nothing, and that there is no such thing as nothing. So that's, that's his conclusion, and that's what I want to leave with. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. This is really fascinating talk. Questions? Or comments? Uh, I have several uh, questions and comments. Uh, but I need to uh, leave aside the, the general uh, framework. Uh, so I'm going to focus on uh, some uh, um, really um, detailed things that are present in your handout. Okay. Uh, for instance, uh, um, on uh, the quote you have from Rachel uh, Zucker, uh -huh. uh, um, where you have this tripartite uh, distinction between bodily pleasure, uh, pleasure, aesthetic pleasure, and intellectual uh, pleasure. Yes. This seems to relate to uh, mm, point 10 and point 11 on your handout, but it's not very clear that you have uh, this distinction in Mendelssohn uh, himself. Right. So, mm, can you comment on that a little bit? So, the, the number, uh, at letter uh, Roman number 10, we have the soul, the body, and together. That's, that's the argument from Theocles. In Zucker, you have 
this term aesthetic, which doesn't exist as such, right? So you have bodily and intellectual map onto tin fairly easily. If you were to say that aesthetic pleasure is both together, then, um, but then, so the question, I, as I see it, is I would look at I would look at Roman numeral ten and say, where does Mendelssohn mention the clear and distinct? Because Theocles only thinks that clear and distinct ideas achieve any kind of beauty or pleasure, right? That there is no obscure, there is no obscure perception that is not imperfect. There, that, that all obscure are imperfect, all clear are perfect. That's, that's Theocles' basic view. So if Rachel Zucker is defending the obscure perception of just bodily, that would map onto Euphemia's view pretty well. The aesthetic is somewhere between them, and then the intellectual is Theocles' view, roughly. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is the uh, construction of uh, what Mendelssohn uh, is doing. And I don't think she is saying that explicitly with respect to this text, but just a kind of overall reading of Mendelssohn. She's not, she's not interpreting the letters on sentiments specifically. She's looking at kind of Mendelssohn and Kant. As you can see, the title is Kant, but she uses Mendelssohn in this text to say, okay, here are three forms of pleasure. I mean, I think that's really helpful to just see them in terms of characters, actually. Although there is no character for the middle one, but but if if one even interprets these definitions of pleasure in terms of character, that contributes to that makes clearer what I what is sometimes obscure is that if multiple definitions of pleasure are possible, as Rachel Zucker is saying, that these are different that characters represent. So you've known nineteen-year-olds who think that partying in video games is all that matters, right? You've known those who sit home and read on Friday nights, like me, and n not have a life, right? You've known these people. They stand for a particular definition of pleasure, like. Yeah, but the problem is that you could have uh, you know, different classical definitions. Uh, you know, for, but all together. The problem is to have this in Mendelssohn. Right. To find this in Mendelssohn's text. But but Mendelssohn makes absolutely explicit, the clear and the clear and distinct and the obscure, but not the, so there, it's the second one that's a little unclear whether that's in. The, the aesthetic pleasure arises from the clear perception of the sensible perfection of objects. Of that one might, you might not find, actually. But the, the first and the third I think you can find. But does Mendelssohn, you're right that Mendelssohn does not define intellectual as clear and distinct. And that bodily by bodily by obscure, yes. And intellectual by clear. Is that I think that's consistent with Roman numeral ten. Is that, is that sort of okay. but I think I think you are onto something is that what is it about Zuckerberg's interpretation that can be found actually in the text? because um, she's of course reconstructing and developing her own theory. And I think I think she does the same problem. She has the same problem with Kant. Is that she is she is putting on a definite definitions that Kant himself or Mendelssohn himself would not hold. So those problems. Can I have yeah, sure. uh, okay, it's about uh, the whole of the imagination. Uh, in the third point of the uh, handout is from Theocles, and it's actually uh, a quote from Theocles. Mm -hmm. where he's uh, in, in describing imagination in the terms of uh, in making order uh, um, that reason and perception teach us. Uh, what is the status of the imagination in this, uh, in, uh, in this dialogue? And that, that is a really good question that no one has written on. So you're welcome to. Um, because I can, I can speak for like tw hours about Kant's view of imagination, but Mendelssohn, I have no idea. I don't know Mendelssohn's role of the imagination. It's, it's rarely mentioned, that's what I can tell you. So I see it here, and it has a role, 
We, call, we only call the structure of the word, word beautiful the proper sense of the term in the imagination. Orders its, but you might just replace that for Mendelssohn with rash, like reasoning ability. Like I don't, imagination does not have a faculty role as in Kant. Um, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also have it in, in the second quotation, in the editor. You, like, you, you have, have yes. Where? Where uh, is it? Quotation B, the editor. Oh, okay. You have uh, the, the very last sentence. That about different representations which unite in our imagination and play a role. So mm -hmm. here seems to be a faculty. And and I can tell you like. No one has written on this. I don't know what imagination in this text, because I'm trying to think of his other texts around the time, and it, it's not very much used, but it is used enough here in those two places to say, okay, what is what is it? I don't know. When it's, I mean, I know Kant's, but of course, in 1755, Kant is, is a young whippersnapper who hasn't written yet much. He hasn't written any, well, he, he has written his PhD, that's it. Um, so he doesn't have a theory of imagination yet. So Mendelssohn, if he's writing about imagination, is influenced by Wolf and Baumgarten. So I, I imagine whatever he's doing, he's just repeating kind of the Wolfian, Baumgartian, Leibnizian view of imagination and not doing anything different. But that's a good question. Uh, I have a suggestion uh, about this. Uh, it might be useful to look at uh, the Jewish tradition. Yeah, yeah, because uh, in the imagination is playing an important role uh, in, in some of the, the medieval Jewish uh, thinkers. Uh, and That's very uh, the imagination is uh, described uh, with respect to uh, reason. So uh, it, it might be useful to, to explore that. Thank you. No, that is there are the Jewish interpreters of, of Mendelssohn as well, and they aren't talking about the imagination, but that's really useful. I don't, I can't, I mean, I, all I can think of is, is uh, so Mendelssohn is very important in the Jewish tradition, actually, for inventing, so to speak, um, what we would call, so there are Reformed Judaic Jews and Orthodox Jews, and he is considered the father of Reformed Judaism. So the Enlightenment said, okay, and that he was friends with Lessing. So have, have you ever heard of the text Nathan the Wise by Lessing? It's a play. Nathan is Mendelssohn. It's representing Mendelssohn. So in Lessing's play, Nathan the Wise, he, he is saying Mendelssohn is this open-minded Jew rather than, and that's, and he actually kind of theorizes the beginning of Reformed Judaism, which is close to, it's as close to saying as possible, you can be a Jew and it's not over against Christianity or Islam, because the three main characters in Nathan the Wise are a Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian, and they like each other, and they get along, and they do dialogue, but they keep their own separate views. So this is important, I think. I don't know how the imagination plays a part yet, but that Mendelssohn constructs an entire kind of, I would say, religious worldview that is tolerant of the other. I mean, it's based on tolerance rather than and was very much an outsider in Germany at the time, although respected as a, as a thinker, but he was not allowed the rights of a normal German of the time in any way. So um, it's, that's, I think, all part of this, too, is his kind of social background, how that influences this social religious influence. Um. I have a question regarding Theocles. What is the argument that he is not Mendelssohn? I don't... Right. So, uh, Mendelssohn is the Leibniz Wolfian of the time, he's an eclectic, mm -hmm. and he clearly um, criticizes this um, English sensualist tradition. Right. Why... Because why? the basic point, he, he, he definitely can't be the same as Euphrenor. He could be the same as Theocles, except that as I see it, Mendelssohn really wants to take the English empiricist tradition seriously. And Theocles listens, but he, he really wants to, in some ways, incorporate an almost, and one can say this is true for Kant as well, take into account empirical reality, 
into the kind of so so that it's Theocles is too rationalist, as I see Mendelssohn, who actually wants to take into account more empirical or feeling elements than Theocles by himself. That's why. That's why. Well, integrate this element, and you see this in his writing from the 60s too, and from what is the Aufklärung. Uh, so he wants to integrate all these elements in a Wolfian synthesis and to. But he also disagrees with Wolf on basic point points. And that, that's where I would try to make a clear argument here is that how Mendelssohn in those writings disagrees with Wolf. I think he's coming to that here. He's not yet. But, but he thinks Wolf is wrong about some very basic things. And that is, I think, even on the point that Nick Nath made about um, the clear and distinct. I, th I think, and this is, I'm stepping out of them here and I could be wrong, that, that Theocles presents too far of a view because Mendelssohn himself did think there were obscure presentations that were pleasurable. Or yes, that's true, but that comes from Baumgartner. That could come from Baumgartner, but not for all. Yes, that's from Baumgartner. And that, this is my other question, mm -hmm. how close is he to Baumgartner? So Baumgartner publishes his aesthetics in... Mm -hmm. 1750. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's very close at this point. Um, I mean, the, the, I mean, the main difference here is style. Like, you read Baumgarten, it's very dry scholastic style, right? And Wolf as well. Mendelssohn is writing a dialogue it, with flowery, you know, he's almost poeticizing the Baumgarten. That's the way I put it. But we're not in the same shift from the question, what is beauty, to the question, how do we feel beauty? Mm -hmm. And here I come to another question I have in the 60s. Um, these uh, letters were translated into French. Hmm. And uh, uh, the term of the moon mm -hmm. were translated into sensations. So yes, how can right. we justify this translation? It seems so very wrong because he goes to criticize the sensualist tradition in fact. So That's a very good question. Sentiments and sensations. Let me let me think about that. Um, and I knew that that happened, but I hadn't, hadn't ever thought about why they chose that translation. I've seen that, and I haven't looked at the French translation, so I've just looked at the German and the English. Because it's, it's very important, because the language at the Berlin Academy at that point was French, and Mendelssohn was very close to all this, Zulitz and Lincoln and others. I don't have an answer for that. I mean, that's a really good question. Do you, do you have any No, no, opinion? I don't either. No. But just one more question of the bit of, maybe I didn't really get this, but what is exactly science here? Is this mathematical method? What is so, science opposed to art? So as I would see it, um, and this goes back to the 17th century, and I think part of this, I mean, I'm hoping that in the future this is part of a chapter on art and science in the 17th. We'll see if Mendelssohn is included. But um, that science in the 17th century is a way of knowing, a kind of, I'm not going to say a, an epistemology, but a way of uh, relating, let's say, as we were talking about today in class, mechanics and matter theory. <laughs> um, so, well, OK. On the one hand, you could define it with Bacon. On the other hand, you can define it with Descartes. And, but I'm going to say, for this, it is a kind of form in which one argues for the way the world works. But, but then in Mendelssohn's text. Yes, yes, in Mendelssohn's text, there is no definition of science. There is no way to, to get that from this text or, or any other text. What is science? that I have found. So as a Belgian, you might say... Nor is there a definition of art. So I'm making those... These so it's not related to method, because you mentioned method here about the suicide and what is particular mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, he definitely has some mathematical way of thinking about 
about science. Um, and it, it does tie to method, but I, I, I would have a hard time finding in the text. I could give him one, but I may be speaking for him. Um, what I do think, unlike even Newton, is that the way that Mendelssohn thinks is more a mixture of art and science than Newton. I do think that. Um, and it, because of people like Shaftesbury, because of uh, the people that Mendelssohn read, including, I think, the Jewish tradition, I think the rabbinic tradition of um, kind of debating but also disagreeing with each other about the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, had a great influence on him, such that he can he thinks in a more polyphonic way than many of the 17th century. Now, I'm, I'm using Galileo and Bruno at the beginning of this paper, and I want to find, I think there are actually probably even better argue, I could better argue for if there are Jewish dialogues like this. I don't know. I haven't found that. But I think Bruno and Galileo are also trying to take some distance from their own perspectives in order to have some form of, let's say, arguing for the Copernican world system without, you can say, you can fix and say, this is Galileo, this is Bruno. And that's, that's what I'm saying here, too, about Mendelssohn, is that you can't just say he's the same as the English. But I, I know that I'm singular in arguing this, so like I already am tinted. Um, and one last uh, precise question. What is the distinction you mentioned between intellectual perfection and sensual perfection? This is very important for that time. What would according to Rachel Zuckert? No, no, according to letter five. So this would be according to according to Diocles, there can't be such a real thing as sensuous perfection. There's sensuous perfection by itself does not exist. So for you, Frenor, though, he believes that we can know something through pure sensuality that is pleasurable and thus. But in order to make that, I mean, the reason why there's a distinction is for Theocles to be able to argue. Now, this relates to the ugly. That's, that's why it's here. We can't know through the senses whether something is perfect because we might have displeasure through something that's ugly that is actually intellectually perfect. I mean, this is also platonic. If you think of platonic beauty, right, it's not the body that makes for what is beauty. It is the soul. It is the forms, right? So Mendelssohn, through this debate, is saying, okay, you have to make this distinction because you will sense something as having some kind of pleasure. I mean, that. now I will look at five again to see. I know that Theocles will say you can't experience something perfect through the senses. I know that. Why this is tied to ugly? That that's I think in order in order to be able to find this perfection within the ugly, one has to use intellectual perfection and not sensuous perfection. I mean, I think that's the the point there. Um, Because why does he say that ugly shapes cloaked by human skin, the innermost tiniest parts of creation, where no eye penetrates, do not cease to be perfect in the sense of being complete and the reciprocal harmony with one another? He is saying there is a kind of perfection that we can't experience through the senses. I mean, that's what that is saying. So we, we can't. And again, I think of Hook's uh, monstrous louse that you see through the, the microscope or something. It seems pretty ugly, but there is something amazing about all these parts that you can intellectually kind of understand and almost find beauty in, even if it's not sensually beautiful at all. Does that make sense? I think I have an example in biology. For example, when you have uh, putrefaction, so you have this process that uh, if it's right, right beside you, you're kind of, uh, you don't want to look or smell it. But uh, with the mind, 
you can reach for it and understand uh, if there was no putrefaction you wouldn't have life I don't know in the woods if, if you wouldn't have uh, I don't know uh, leaves that uh, biodegrade and uh, something like this you don't have food for the uh, I don't know all sorts of bacteria and animals so with the senses you don't see the beautiness maybe uh, and it's kind of repelling but with the mind if you understand what that process is you can see the beautiness of it mm -hmm. I'm thinking and in the, to use an 18th century example everyone who saw the Alps thought they were ugly but in the yeah. 19th century the Alps like in Switzerland and yeah. Austria and in the 19th century once romanticism kind of became a thing people started thinking the Alps were beautiful but is it that the Alps are in themselves? But like, why was it that no one wanted to travel and go there before the 18th century because they were considered ugly? And then something in history. So I mean, putrefaction is is, is similar only in so far as like, I'm not saying beauty and ugliness is purely relative. I'm saying that we can't always see it at the time. Like one has to bring in other. Like, you, I mean, I think, I think that's a learned experience. I mean, I mean if, uh, if people told me the Alps are, Alps are ugly, and I'm used with this idea, maybe I'm gonna see them ugly. But if I see them beautiful, and all the people, uh, and I see them without knowing about them being ugly, and uh, then some of the, those are not beautiful, like, I can say, I don't think so. I really think they're beautiful. So, but I, I didn't knew this uh, part of history that the Alps were considered ugly. I, I cannot imagine that, but... You know, I, I think it's hard for anyone in our, our culture to imagine that, <laughs> but that that was the case <laughs> for... And, and part of it is probably because you could die, you know, like... I, I'm thinking like... You still uh, can die, but... Were there people that went to the Alps and came back and said they are ugly? Or only that was from a... Uh... Well, a lot of it is through travel literature. That's the way it's discussed, it right? So the travel literature, they will say what's worth going to and what's not. And the travel literature only comes really into play in the 18th century. I mean, there isn't much. There is some, but challenge me if I'm wrong. But I, th I think tra travel literature becomes more and more with with more and more readers. From mm -hmm. like, this quotation only, I would say that perfection here is um, identical to completeness, to being complete. But this is an intellectual, this refers to notions, mm -hmm. so right. to intellectual perfection, finally. Yeah, and I think that's the only way that ugliness can be made sense, is just through some kind of intellectual, so putrefaction we can know as having some scientific, whatever however that's defined, value, and thus we don't, ex I mean, or, I mean, I'm trying to think of a really ugly example. And I have to go to art, but you, you've heard of this famous Italian artist who donated his, his shit uh, called Merda to Italian, and he donated to a museum and a can, right? And it exploded because of the chemical, it really physically, and the museum sued him because they're like, you gave it to us in a can that was sealed. I'm thinking of an example. Now, is, and this is what happens in avant-garde art all the time, is that somehow the artist is challenging the entire notion of boundaries to say, okay, the exploded can of shit on your, on your museum floor, which smells, is beautiful, or is, Meaningful, not beautiful, but meaningful. And the museum said, no, we disagree. We bought it in a can that was enclosed, and we're going to sue your ass. Yes. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. Yes, I've already used too many swear words today, as, as the Descartes class can tell you. Um, that's my alarm. Wow. Sorry. Just one regard, regarding uh, curved lines. He said that uh, usually curved lines were 
uh, thought as uh, kind of soothing or beautiful instead of strange. Yes. Uh, yes. And I'm thinking like uh, usually in uh, nature, in re in reality, you don't find find real straight lines. I cannot. I, I don't know. Maybe a ray of light or something like that, but not even. So you don't really find st really straight lines, or uh, all of them are kind of curved. So it's kind of natural to be more attracted to something that is natural than something that is, you know, maybe only mathematical. Or, and not, I do not say not natural, but mm -hmm. the, the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, that you don't find straight lines in nature, and so therefore somehow nature is pervasive of a kind of beauty that you know, it's, it's kind of like an argument why did he thought only uh, curved lines are soothing or uh, beautiful or pleasant to the eye instead of uh, right corners or straight lines or anybody else have, have a Why they're more pleasurable? I mean, are, are you saying, more did Hogarth have arguments for this? Or Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn yeah. mentions this as kind of pointing to, because in 1753, Hogarth publishes Analysis of Beauty, and then the basic point of the analysis of beauty is that the line of beauty is more pleasurable or beautiful than, or a curved line is more, and, and that's because of its, It's, I mean, and this I think goes for like what we were talking about today in class, rectilinear versus curved motion, if that's the right term, right? That for Newton and Descartes, they thought straight lines or rectilinear motion is the natural motion. And for Galileo, he thinks that curved is more natural, um, or, or the Aristotelian world system is that everything is... So, so I think, in some ways, exactly that, and I would have to make this argument and have to figure this out, is a way of relating art and science, even Hogarth's line of beauty, um, who is a painter who's writing a very practical treatise. So he's not really giving you philosophical reasons. He's not supporting why, though. He's just saying it is. He's just describing it. Yeah. So, well, I think Mendelssohn, though, isn't just a painter or a practitioner, he's actually a theorist who's coming up with reasons and with the line of beauty, there's a footnote in my paper about this, but um, why it's more pleasurable is, a, is a, something I'll have to think about over beer. And as Donna always says, we'll take this to a more, unless you have other questions, a more informal place. Well, I, I, I you do. Okay. Um, it's a good bit more general. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about art and science in the text, but there's something else that comes up all the time, and yeah. that's ethics. Yeah. And I was wondering why they did, kind of, I had the impression you tried to, to avoid it. But you have here good and, and beautiful. You have ideas about evil, and of course you have the suicide that has a very mm -hmm. strong ethical the, the basic answer to that is that Mendelssohn is fundamentally, I would say, Shaftesburian, which is platonic, which beauty and good are the same thing. For, for, for Mendelssohn, I think ultimately, for Kant, beauty is the symbol of the good, Kant will say. Um, but I think for Mendelssohn, he is not trying to divorce beauty and the good. Um, of course, Euphrenor, by himself, Euphrenor is, but, but I think because of his theological Jewish way of, of thinking, that is also Wolfian and Baumgartian, there isn't a division. Um, so his argument, let's say, on suicide or on, is fundamentally that that actually 
life in, in general, and this is Leibnizian, everything that happens in life, even when you are the most depressed, is somehow good and pleasurable. I mean, I mean, even in the ugly, intellectually speaking, one can see that there's good in that. So the good and the beautiful, and I, I'm, I'm saying beautiful, ugly, right, or ultimately from this, I mean, from the point of view of eternity, to use this Spinozism, um, for Mendelssohn, even what seems bad is really good, even what seems ugly is really, I mean, I think there is a, a realm, I mean, the evil, of a, there is a temptation, so, so to speak, like, the reason why Eudoxus is in there is no question in order to defend the view of suicide. Mm -hmm. And that Mendelssohn is arguing, and I think it should be mentioned in the text that I haven't done, is that the, the ethics and aesthetics are really the same thing. That the, the same reason why you live life is both kind of like the duck rabbit. You can see it from an aesthetic or an ethical standpoint, but it's really the I mean, not that Mendelssohn read Wittgenstein, but I, I, I think his way of thinking about ethics and aesthetics are two ways of seeing the same thing. Um, that's, and that's my interpretation. I don't, I mean, I'm just thinking through all of the Mendelssohn secondary literature to see whether they will divide ethics. And some write about ethics and some write about, but I think none of them say that these are. Now, in Euphrenor's voice, yes. Euphrenor is saying. Well, also in Theocles, if he quotes this idea that the good judgment is more important than uh, the judgment beautiful. Oh yes, yes, you're right. That that letter. Mm -hmm. And that's that I think is an example of where Mendelssohn might not agree with that. I don't think Mendelssohn mm -hmm. agrees with that view, and that would argue you, you disagree. I disagree. Okay. Okay. Discipline for Mendelssohn. Uh -huh. Everything is subordinated to ethics, and this. But he writes so many more texts on this though. But it's always the same idea. It's his basic interpretation of the Ophian, of the Enlightenment, with the German Enlightenment. I think you can find this absolutely everywhere in Mendelssohn, and this is why he's a popular philosopher. And not a He is a popular. And not like what? Kant, an eclectic. Okay. Do you say eclectic? Uh, I mean, I know the term, and yes, I know so it's in the like literature. Kant or other Germans? Kant. But see, Kant definitely thought ethics was over aesthetics. I mean. But in a different way. <coughs> so the, the argument is different in Kant. So this but see, the, Mendelssohn has no single here. text on ethics. There's no single text of Mendelssohn. But it's, it's everywhere. The argument. No, it's about ethics and aesthetics. But, I mean, I would disagree, but I, I think you have an argument. For it. <laughs> well, it's definitely a sort of a constant idea. Right? Yeah, I mean, and I would say they're on the same level, but because of, I mean, there's no question that he is influenced by Plato in many ways. Would you say Plato ethics is above? I don't think it's necessarily Plato here. Okay. Or Shasta. Specific uh, characteristic of German Enlightenment at that time. It's very popular, very. You can find it frequently in the literature, in, the, in philosophy and literature. No, I, yeah, I don't, disagree, I don't disagree with that. I just. Hmm. I mean, that, that challenge is my way of reading this text, for sure. If that's true, then it should be his answer to ethics the, and science. <laughs> his answer to the um, a question um, raised by the Academy, the Berlin Academy, uh, the answers were published in 63, and he won the first prize. Yes. It's about evidence and in moral and yep. theology, so he would have it there, purely, mm -hmm. but developed, and but you find it everywhere under his death. Well, I, unless there are other pressing questions, I think we can all agree that what we are now is beautiful and pleasurable. <laughs> and pleasurable. And pleasurable and good. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, Michael.